Hello, subscribers and others watching. David Hoffman, filmmaker. I'm about to show you a story that I made back in 1997 about a woman who flew around the world herself, solo piloting, to do what Amelia Earhart had said she was going to do, but Amelia died along the way. Do you know the story of Amelia Earhart? Do you know who Amelia Earhart was? Well, she was an extraordinary American woman. She was a pilot at the time of the great racing days of aviation, when these pilots, like Amelia Earhart, were stars like Hollywood stars or rock stars, very famous, world famous. She was beautiful, she was outspoken, she was courageous, and she was a kind of a symbol for women of the things women could do. She made this statement largely to women. You should have your dreams and you should not live within the limits that society has set for you. So think about this woman, Linda Finch. Linda Finch, a businesswoman, real estate developer, successful woman, becomes addicted to flying and she rebuilds the exact plane, exactly, that Amelia Earhart flew, the Lockheed 10E. And she trains herself and she gets a navigator just like Amelia did and she sets off in 1997 to fly around the world. I think she called her project You Can Soar. Amelia accomplished what she accomplished with a lot of class and a lot of style. And she had the backing of her husband, who was a rich guy, George Putnam. To give you an idea of her character, in her prenup she said, look, if either one of us wants to get out of this in the first year, we can separate with no cost. So she was not all that hot to get married, but she did need George Putnam's support. And she says she's going to fly around the world. She's going to take off from Oakland and fly around the world and be the first woman, solo pilot, to fly around the world. She doesn't make it. She dies somewhere in the South Pacific. Nobody knows exactly where. There have been many efforts to find Amelia. The last one, I think in 2019, summer of 2019, Robert Vallad, the great uh, nautical explorer, goes out with all of his team to this little teeny island where they think they heard the signal from her airplane, the distress signal. And they did not find anything, unfortunately. The plane probably disintegrated, but the engines might still be there. So there's still people looking for what happened to Amelia Earhart. It was, and to some extent still is, national news. So you're about to see a film where Linda Finch attempts to recreate that flight. And this time she has tens of millions of American students following. NASA is following her online. But still, it's a pretty tough trip. She'll tell you about it in this film. I have restored several airplanes in the past, and I was looking for a new airplane project and started really to kind of research what I wanted to do and think about that a little bit. And I wanted something that was more graceful. I wanted something that was older and of a different era, calmer, but exciting era at the same time. And the Electra first caught my attention. As I was learning about the Electra, the first thing I had to do was learn about Amelia. And I got these books that she wrote, and I could I could feel what she was saying. I'd start laughing out loud. It was just she would use the same words or, you know, or describe the same feelings. It was, it was just, you know, it was like I just knew her. She captivated us. She was doing the things all of us, the female pilots, wanted to do. They called us daredevils of the skies, but she, she was our heroine. It wasn't her beauty. She had a special way about her. She was up there with the gods, yet she acted as if she was on the same level as the rest of us. My name is Amelia Earhart. And uh, your occupation? I'm a flyer. It was almost 60 years ago when Amelia Earhart took off on her world flight. It was the most challenging air adventure anyone had attempted. 27,000 miles around the world at the equator. 60 years later, on March 17, 1997, Linda Finch, accomplished pilot and San Antonio businesswoman will attempt to recreate Amelia's expedition in a perfectly restored Electra. 
I will be recreating it in exactly the same aircraft, the model that she used. It is a Lockheed Electra 10E. There's one of two left in the world. There were only about 15 manufactured ever, so it's a very rare aircraft. And it's being restored as an exact replica of Amelia's airplane. The route will be exactly the same as she flew, with the exception of landing at Howland Island, which there's no longer a runway. But we will overfly Howland and drop a wreath in, in her memory there. She was absolutely fearless. Absolutely fearless. More so than I. Absolutely more so than I. She flew across the Atlantic initially as a passenger, and she got more attention than the pilot. Nobody knows the name of that pilot that flew across the Atlantic in 1928. Nobody. And Amelia was the most famous woman in the world. She described her experience as being like a sack of potatoes. She was totally useless. And she was somewhat embarrassed by the attention that she received. There was nobody else to look up to. She was uh, the only heroine we had. We looked forward to the next edition of the paper to see what Amelia was doing next. In 1932, five years to the day on the anniversary of Lindbergh's flight, is when she flew solo across the Atlantic. Approximately 17 attempts had failed, many of the people had died. No one else could duplicate what he had done, and she did. Looking back at Amelia, all we can see are gracious public performances before the newsreel cameras. But what she achieved in those old airplanes was no mean feat. What is the latest report on the weather? It took great courage to attempt to cross the Atlantic alone. Please don't forget the phone just the minute you get there. Eh? I will. Goodbye. So Writing in her log, Amelia described it this way. At 12 minutes after 7, the wind was right at Harbor Grace, so I gave my Vega the gun. Despite the heavy fuel load, she rose immediately. A minute later, I was headed out to sea. Cruising at about 12,000 feet, an enormous cloud loomed before me. It was too high for me to climb over, so I had to fly straight into an electrical storm. The wind tossed and battered the Vega. I couldn't see out of my cockpit and was flying completely blind. My altimeter failed, leaving me to guess in the dark how high or low I was flying. It was impossible to stay on course. I began picking up ice, a hazard all flyers dread. At the same time, a weld in the exhaust manifold cracked and flames from the engine blazed in the night. I dived down in the hope that the ice would melt. But heavy with ice, my plane went into a spin. I pulled out of it so near to the sea that I could see the waves breaking beneath me. I was forced to climb. It wasn't safe to use my instruments so near the surface because of the fog. Ice formed again on the windshield. For the next 10 hours, I fought to stay low enough to prevent icing, but high enough to fly safely on my instruments. The cabin stank of gas fumes, but it was critical to have fuel for the engine. My transatlantic rations consisted of one can of tomato juice, which I pierced with an ice pick. The last two hours were the hardest. When I reached up to turn on my reserve fuel tank, I found the gauge was broken. Gasoline began dripping down the back of my neck. I had no idea how much fuel I had left. Shortly after dawn, I spotted a fishing boat and then a coastline. I couldn't see a landing field, so I came down in a long, sloping meadow. Amelia's landing in Ireland took local farmer Dan McCallion by surprise. Where am I, she asked him. You're in Derry, sir. In Derry? Oh, Londonderry. Yes, sir. I, I mean, ma'am. And, and have you come far? From America. Holy Mother of God, McCallion muttered. It wasn't long before she was besieged by newsmen, photographers, and autograph hunters. The world had fallen in love with Amelia Earhart. When she returned to New York, Amelia was America's darling. Get your ticker tape ready and tear up your confetti because it's going to be a big parade. She didn't like the fame, but she accepted it because it was what she had to do if she was going to accomplish what she wanted to do, which was to inspire women to get off their duffs and, and do what they wanted to do, you know? She'll be the first girl to do it. She'll fly around the world. So don't forget who flew it. Have that funding unfurled. When the million air heart circles the globe and come flying home again. It does not take courage so 
much to go as it does interest in the task. I believe that women have as much courage as men. Flying was really secondary to her mission of communicating to people that they did not have to live within the limits that society set for them. And her big, her big message at that time was women in the early 1930s that were so cared for that they were taught limits. They were taught to live smaller lives than they needed to do. Amelia inspired women to conquer new horizons. Eleanor Roosevelt said she helped the cause of women by giving us a feeling there was nothing we couldn't do. Yesterday, I hopped off from Los Angeles about noontime and landed in Newark this morning after a nonstop transcontinental trip. It took me 19 hours and a few minutes to complete the journey. And what did you carry on the trip? You mean to eat? Yeah, to eat and drink. Well, I carried some water, of course, because my cockpit is very warm. And I carried a sandwich in case. I didn't eat it, though. I carried some hot chocolate and um, the old reliable tomato juice. Amelia Earhart kept on pushing. Nothing was going to stop her. She had a dream, a vision for her future, a vision she had not yet stated publicly, but we all felt it was coming. Well, I haven't made any flight announcements yet officially, but maybe some of the guesses are right. Anyway, the ship is equipped to fly a long distance. She mentioned to us that she was considering an expedition around the equator. She would need an Electra, the most modern, most graceful airplane we had ever seen. Linda Finch is determined to recreate Earhart's flight exactly. To succeed, her 60-year-old Electra must be restored to absolute perfection. When the airplane got here, it was on a trailer, almost like at an angle, like it would be banking. And it was all nasty, and half the paint was stripped, and half of it was off, and the wings were laying underneath. And it came around the corner of the hangar. And when I saw that, I mean, I just had goosebumps. And it was almost like her plane was just coming back. I've got the rest of these pictures, guys. Oh, great. When I first got here, I was like, well, where's the blueprints? And they showed me a stack of photographs. You know, and here's a magnifying glass. And that's how we had to count. We actually counted rivets, you know, out of a photograph. Okay, look, it's 12 rivets back, and that's where that line goes. And I mean, that's how we put this thing together. This is a piece that we're going to have to go to Oakland and take off of Fred's airplane, this right-hand side. There's no way to know to begin with whether we had all the parts or what parts were actually missing till we got to the point of actually assembling some of them. Yeah, this is really like this. Yes, ma'am. That's the leading edge up there. Okay. The There's the front. There's a couple of holes. When I took the fittings out of the spar, I was pulling hay and rats' nests Bird and all kinds of stuff out of birds' you know, nests. It was definitely going going to airplane heaven if she didn't pull it up out of there. Yeah, it, it was already yeah. on its way yeah, there. It was so. well on its way. But now it, it's phenomenal. Was you know, It looks like a brand new craft now. From the moment she first flew, Amelia became passionate about flying. As soon as I was two or three hundred feet off the ground, she said, I knew I had to fly. And her family wasn't wealthy, you know. She did 27 different jobs to pay for lessons. She drove a truck, learned photography. She was even a nurse for a while. Nothing could stop her from flying. She could have done anything she wanted to do, but I think uh, she felt that she could reach more people, more women, through aviation because it was a new thing, it was a glamorous thing, and uh, it was a visible thing. We were thrilled when Amelia announced she was going to fly around the world. It was big news everywhere. The plane I'm using on the proposed flight is a transport plane. It is a Lockheed Electra, uh, normally carrying 10 passengers and two pilots. In place of the passenger seats, I've installed uh, large gasoline tanks. Linda Finch, like Amelia Earhart, has had to pull out the passenger seats to fill the plane with fuel for flights that'll be two or three times the Electra's normal range. It was a huge risk for Amelia, a risk Linda faces, too. Contemplated course covers about 27,000 miles. 
Uh, it will be the first flight, if successful, which approximates the equator. I hope to fly from Oakland to Honolulu, then Howland Island, then to the... The equator, the longest, hottest, and most desolate route one could take around the world. Nowhere else would the physical stresses be so challenging. Nowhere else is the sun so high in the day at midday for so many days of the year. Nowhere else is there less time to adjust between day and night. Through Mexico and back to the starting point. You expect to accomplish something for aviation, do you not? Well, yes, I do. And if the flight's successful, I hope it will increase women's interest in flying. If so, it will be worthwhile as far as I'm concerned. Well, how about taking me along? Well, of course, I think a great deal of you, but 180 pounds of gasoline on a flight perhaps might be a little more valuable. You mean you prefer 180 pounds of gasoline to 180 pounds of husband? Thank you guessed right. As Linda Finch restores her Electra, major changes take place daily. She had to search nationwide to find parts for her Pratt & Whitney Wasp engines. They haven't been manufactured since 1961. The wings are fragile, thin sheets of aluminum stretched almost to the breaking point. Having to reskin one would cripple Finch's tight schedule. The smooth lines of the Electra demand compound curves in the metal. Finch was forced to restore antique tools from the 1930s to refinish the plain skin. About ready? I think she would have borrowed all the money if she had to to accomplish this mission because she wants the world to know how great Amelia was. She wants to show how great this accomplishment could have been had it been completed back then. And I think that's a great purpose. This isn't the Linda Finch show. This is the Amelia Earhart show. Closer. All right, closer. And? In again. Oh, beautiful. You got all go on. Okay, we're in. Today we got the wing on for the first time, and to see it with the wing on is just phenomenal, just absolutely phenomenal. The airplane is so graceful, it's, it's just very, very special. The round the world ladybird and her crew, ready for an adventure that nobody has ever tried before. Amelia Earhart out to circle the Earth at the latitude of the equator, and that's the Earth's greatest circle. The On March 17, 1937, Amelia Earhart made her final checks before taking off on her flight around the world. We held our breath when she finally took off from Oakland for Honolulu. A few of us knew she thought this would be her swan song. I have a feeling, she wrote to her husband, that there is just about one more good flight left in my system. I hope this trip is it. When I've finished, I mean to give up long-distance stunt flying. If any of our sex can make it, Amelia's the girl. The fast ship had been checked for the 27,000-mile flight, and it was on to Honolulu. Things did not go well for Amelia. In Honolulu, she crashed on takeoff. She ground looped the Electra. It just weighed too much. She was lucky she didn't die. She shipped it back to California in pieces. There was a, a lot of damage. Um, both the engines were destroyed, the propellers, the wings, the gear, the entire undercarriage of the aircraft. And also, it was sitting in a, a big puddle of fuel. She had skidded across the runway in all that fuel because the fuel tanks had broken as well. She had always succeeded in the other flights. And uh, when she cracked up in Honolulu, there was no question. There, anybody else would have said, well, that, that's it. But she uh, said no. She just took the plane back to look, California, had it repaired, and went the other way. It was almost three months later when Earhart tried again. It was a rainy June morning. The trade winds had changed direction, so she had to fly east. Going east meant she'd hit the longest and most dangerous Pacific lakes at the end of her journey. This departure was quiet. She just got into her airplane and left. A 
Amelia was to set a record flying as close as she could to the equator. And that's what had never been done before, was to fly at the equator. And that's where most of our trip is, across Africa, at the equator, all around Indochina. Um, and it's going to be, there are days that she talked about it being 120 degrees outside. Across Brazil, the stresses of the flight began to show. Amelia wrote in her log, Just came through very heavy rain. It blotted out everything. Gas fumes in the plane made me sick. Stomach getting weaker. But she was in a hurry. She flew um, all 22,000 miles. She did all but the last three legs of her trip before she was lost. And she did that in a little over 30 days. So she didn't want to go and have lots of social functions or stop and have dinners. And when she got to Paramaribo, they brought dinner out to her. And they set up uh, dinner in their hangar, and they all ate together there with the engine in the background. They had to fuel the aircraft themselves from very remote locations. There were barrels all over the world with Amelia Earhart written on those barrels of fuel. People pumped gasoline into my ship from drums, coffee, orange juice, sandwiches. I've never had better service at any airport. We're stuck with the same problems they had, with the fact we will be 50% over the gross weight of the aircraft, that on takeoff at those kinds of weights, the airplane will not fly on one engine. So if we have one engine stop for any reason, the fuel doesn't flow, a fuel pump doesn't work, an oil pump doesn't work, or you know many things that have to, to work properly to support that engine running, and we lose one engine, we will not be able to fly. The airplane will crash. Amelia's expedition was getting more and more uncomfortable direst cockpit I've ever had, seeing nothing but rain through wispy clouds. Oil from the props and rain on the windshield have made a smeary emulsion, having trouble seeing. We have to fly about six to 10,000 feet most of the way around the world. If we have weather, we cannot go over it, and in many cases, our fuel's gonna be limited and we can't go around it. Tried to get something on the radio. No go, rain, static. Never seen such rain. Had to use the secondary grass runway. The long one was unavailable because of perverse wind. We're going to land at exactly the same runway Amelia landed. There's several that are gonna be grass, several dirt strips. Many of them are very desolate. There's not anything. As we go across Africa and even you know, down through South America, there's some that are not large cities. Like Amelia, Linda will be at the controls for 19 hours at a time. Exhaustion may be her biggest challenge. We're always pushing through, trying to get to some other place instead of enjoying the place we're in. But I've made my schedule, and I'm going to abide by it. Natal to Dakar is uh, 1,700 miles. And oh, other than uh, this one island here, there's not anything else. <laughs> Man, there's not much to go to there. No. Linda and navigator Denny Girangeli will have to land on remote islands that don't have fuel sources, so they plan to float fuel onto these islands and pump it by hand. If they float it onto the island with barrels, there's somebody there in attendance, or we get there, we fuel it. We get, we get there, there, we fuel, fuel it. <laughs> Crossed into Rangoon, encountered more rain, terrible monsoons. The wind, dead ahead, began to whip furiously, the deluge so savage it beat off patches of paint along the leading edge of the wings. We will have delays because of weather and we'll have problems, and there'll be many times we have to fly every day, all in a row. The airplane is extraordinarily loud. The engines um, sit beside you with the propellers beside you, so you have all of both the prop noise, which is very loud with, as it goes through the air, and the engine noise. Um, there's very little or no insulation between you and the windows are open. I mean, there's not even anything there, so there's, there's nothing to get rid of that. And it will be very tiring. There is a risk, certainly. It's not that I don't understand that, but I still feel like that can be managed. She is the driving force behind it, and uh, I think she's got Amelia's tenacity to carry it through. Lay New Guinea. After being grounded for two days, Amelia was impatient to get going. The Electra stands ready for her longest hop, weighted with gasoline and oil to capacity. 
Finally, on July 2nd, Amelia felt the weather was as good as it would ever be. And so she took off. Her takeoff at, at Lay was very difficult. It was amazing that she handled the airplane as well as she did and even got off. She went off the edge of the runway and the plane actually dropped back down. And I believe as she went out of sight, there were witnesses that said that she was no more than 100 feet above the water. She was so heavy. Amelia was flying the biggest challenge of her trip, the longest leg, the heaviest fuel load, heading for a tiny landing spot amid miles and miles of open sea, Howland Island. Amelia's problem really was finding Howland Island, and Howland Island was so small, it's so tiny, tiny, and it um, you know, has no elevation, less than 20 feet of elevation, a half mile wide, two miles long in the middle of nothing there there were not good points at which to be able to judge that she was on track so she had to use only the celestial navigation um, if it was cloudy then she couldn't do that the island was not in the right place on the charts in the early morning amelia was bound eastward across the lonely mid-pacific several hours later she was gone Amelia's disappearance shocked the world. It was front page news everywhere, and it motivated the largest sea hunt in history. In three weeks, 250,000 square miles of ocean were scanned, but there was no sign of Amelia Earhart. People ask me, what do you think happened to Amelia? And my answer is, I don't have an opinion, and it's not important. I don't care what happened to her. It's, it doesn't matter anymore. What we care about and what we should focus on is her accomplishments, the things that she gave to the world. Before she took off, Amelia wrote to her husband, Please know that I am quite aware of the hazards. I want to do it because I want to do it. Women must try as men have tried. When they fail, their failure must be but a challenge to others. Her purpose in flights was to communicate her message. And the purpose of the flight is to get that message back across to people and remind them of what a hero she was and how important she truly was. I, I can't tell you how many people come up to me and write letters to me constantly about what a difference she made in their individual lives. And I think if we remind people of that now, that, that she'll make the same difference and that this flight and this project and I can make a difference. In America, you can do whatever you set your mind to do. And it's tragic that some generations don't think that's true anymore. So if Linda can help us feel that way again for a brief moment, and maybe for the next generation that watches her, she will have accomplished much more than helping Amelia go down properly in history. Whenever a woman uh, is able to accomplish something, uh, you know, Linda's trip is, su is successful. Eileen Collins is flying in the space shuttle. Uh, Shannon Lucid is up on your space station now. It just allows the young girls to say, yeah, this is open to me. I can do this. I'd like to do that. Gee, that sounds exciting. Now, what do I have to do to be able to qualify to do this sort of thing? Linda Finch must practice in this World War II trainer to keep her flying skills sharp. In August 1996, at the Great Experimental Aviation Association Air Show in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, she will fly her Electra in public and announce her expedition. World Flight 1997 will be underway. From that moment on, for Linda Finch, there'll be no going back. I guess what says it best, my daughter bought me a book for my birthday recently, and she wrote in there that, um, that, that I have a chance to inspire others, you know, not just her, that, that all her life I've been an inspiration to her, but that I really get to communicate that to others at the same time. It was very touching. Pilot Louise Thayton a friend of Amelia Earhart, wrote, Flight is abiding peace, 
absolute serenity. It is faith and compassion, purest joy. It is a spirit totally free. Flight is yesterday's yearning, the fulfillment of today's dreams, tomorrow's promises.